Hi friends, Apostle Price here. This year, we are celebrating 35 years of ever-increasing faith television. We are still walking by faith. During this year, we will air some of our most popular classic series from years gone by. Remember, you have made it happen for the past 35 years. I appreciate your loyalty. Stay with us and enjoy my classic teachings. Get involved. Visit faithdome.org for more details. From Los Angeles, California, ever increasing faith with pastor and teacher, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price. Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, praise God for another day and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. We've been teaching of late on the subject, the Christian family. And as the title suggests, it is a study on the family relationship of God's family that he has created in this earth realm. And of course, that's us, the Christian community. God has specific plans for his family. So we're talking about the Christian family. And in talking about the Christian family, we're going to be dealing with the relationship and duties of the husband, the wife, the children, the parents. We'll be talking about areas of the interpersonal relationship of the family, and especially what we'll be talking about uh, the relationship of the husband and wife from the sexual standpoint. And as I have been uh, prefacing each one of these sessions, because we have new people present here in the auditorium and then also new people watching by television, and you're just getting in on something that's already started a couple of weeks ago or a couple of sessions ago, and I don't want you to be surprised, I don't want you to be offended, and I don't want you to, be, uh, to feel that you're being, you're being put upon. And I, I said it at the very beginning that I will be dealing with subjects and we're going to just let it all hang out as it were and deal with things right where they are, the realities that every one of you have to deal with in your everyday life. So I will be saying some things perhaps that most people won't talk about publicly. And so I don't want you to feel that I'm being vulgar. I'm not. If you, if you take it as vulgarity, that's because you have the problem. I don't. But I want you to be aware of it because I know that we have people that have their children watching the television broadcast. And sometimes uh, you may not want your children to hear these things yet because maybe you want to tell them or whatever. So I want to preface each one of the lessons because I'm not exactly sure where in the teaching on this series, where I will get into certain things and where I will be saying certain things that perhaps you don't want to hear or don't want to deal with. So I want you to be aware of it so that you don't feel that I, as I say, that I'm putting something off on you. And so if you have a problem with discussion, with the discussion of things like sex and the relationship of a husband and wife and other things like that, intimate things, and you can't handle that, best thing to do is don't watch the program. Maybe just turn on at the very beginning and find out what subject I'm still on. And then if, you, if I say Christian family, then you have the choice now to make the decision as to whether you want to listen or not. But I, I want to just save you a lot, of, a lot of time. Don't write me some letters, you know, about I shouldn't say this or shouldn't say that or shouldn't say the other. I get my orders from the high command. And uh, I'm on assignment. And I know my place. And so I'm dealing with it the way God gives it to me. Each one of us is a different uh, species, as it were, individually. And so God works with us in a different way. So I just wanted you to know that. Now, in our last lesson, we were talking about marriage, divorce, and the obligation. In other words, we were talking about, if I get married, do I have to stay married to the person regardless? We used, uh, dealt with many scriptures that had to do with what the Bible says about divorce. And then I dealt with what I call another view. And it was designed, or is designed, I believe, to show what is behind what we see in the Bible on the printed page concerning divorce. And we pointed out that the Bible tells us very clearly that there is what's called the letter of the law. 
and there is the spirit of the law. Meaning that, and then it said that the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And so there is a spirit behind the letters. And so we need to understand what the spirit is. In other words, what is God's intent? We see what the word says, we see what the letter says, but what's the intent behind it? Because we have to not only deal with the word of God, but we have to deal with the word of God as it relates to our lives in an everyday and practical way. And so I, I said that it's not my intent to try to, to skirt the issue of what the Bible says about divorce. Uh, you're perfectly free to, to take the letter of divorce what it says in the Bible, and if you've been in a relationship and perhaps you're divorced now and you feel because of perhaps some prior training in a particular denomination or church that you're not, you cannot get married again until your spouse who may still be living somewhere in the world dies or unless your divorce was because of fornication, uh, adultery, uh, then you have legal grounds for divorce. But as I pointed out, God certainly has made some exceptions throughout the word relative to this relationship of marriage. Now, I want to sort of uh, give my summation for the jury, if you would, Your Honor. And then we'll move on to another aspect. We looked at the fact that God instituted marriage in the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden. But now you have to remember, and always keep this in mind, that when God instituted the husband and the wife, man and woman, they were walking in line with God's word. They were walking on the highest spiritual level that a man and woman could walk on. And what it was, was that that was the ideal. That was the high, highest level. That's where it ought to be. But it's the same thing as I've said before about sin. The, 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 the ideal is don't sin. But folk do sin, don't they? And God has made provision for it. He doesn't just cut us off because we sin. He tells us if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's an exception. That's certainly not God's best. God's best is not sin. God's best is not to sin. But what do you do if somebody sins? You liquidate them? You get rid of them? Thank God he doesn't because if so, this building would be empty now. I mean empty, empty. Huh? I mean empty, empty, empty. So, thank God for the mercy of God. Now, the ideal is that we ought to marry and stay married. But, again, that is assuming, from God's vantage point, that two people are starting out, both of them in the Word, both of them filled with the Spirit, both of them knowing their covenant right, both of them matured, walking in the Word. But you know as well as I do that folk don't get married on that basis. Not very often. Not as often as they should. Folk get married and get together on all kinds of reasons. And then they have to grow up in it. And even with the Christians who both are walking in the Word, there's still a growing period. You have to grow up. Marriage doesn't work by itself. You're going to have challenges. You think about somebody maybe 20 years old. They've lived with themselves 20 years. Here comes another person 20 years old. They've lived with themselves 20 years. You're combining 40 years of People walking alone. Now suddenly you're going to amalgamate them, bring them together, and they have to change their way of doing things to accommodate another life. That's going to take time to grow. And if you don't allow that time to grow, then you're going to have a miserable existence. So I believe that the, the, the God's best is you marry and stay married. But again, that's assuming you know the word, you're committed to the word, and you love the word enough to make whatever adjustment is necessary so that the word has first place in your life. If you do that, there's no way in the world that you can't have a successful relationship. But now what do we do with the people that have been divorced? And what do you do with somebody now that's living with somebody who is an absolute monster? And you see, you can, you can pray and believe God for your mate. But that's not a guarantee. I'm telling you to do it. Yes, do it. Until you make some decision of whether you're going to stay there or whether you're going to go or whatever. But you can't just pray and it's going to violate somebody's free will. They still have to exercise their will. 
And through your praying, all God can do is send somebody to that person with the word that they may hear it and then respond to it. God can't just go and change their will because you've prayed. If that were true, then we could get all the sinners saved overnight. There wouldn't be any problem about it. All we'd have to do is just get all the, go through all the telephone books and get all the names of all the people, you know, and then just put those names out before God and tell him, go change their mind and make them get saved. Well, he doesn't do that. So you may be married to a monster and you may go to your grave with that monster. In fact, that monster may put you in your grave. So what does a person do? Are they obligated to stay in that relationship though this guy is beating on your head week by week? Though he is misusing you and abusing you and violating the children? I mean, what is a person supposed to do? I cannot believe that that's God's best. I cannot believe that God intends for his child to remain in a relationship with the child of the devil and be abused and perhaps lose your life in that arena and that that pleases God and you have to stay there come hell or high water. I, personally, I have a problem with that because Jesus said, I came that you have, might have life and have it more abundantly and, that, uh, and that's not abundant living. What do you do? The guy's beating on your head. I mean, he could kill you. What do you do? Well, you have to make the decision. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anybody to get a divorce, even though I want to tell somebody to get a divorce. I've w sat across the desks of many people counseling with them, and I wanted to tell them. I said, why don't you leave that fool? You are married to a fool. That's what I want to say. I wouldn't dare say that. Because just as sure, they'd go out and say, the Pastor Pratt told me to divorce you. And then two weeks later, here comes Godzilla looking for me. Oh, no. No, no, no. What I do is I tell them what the options are. I let them know you have some options. There's always more than one way. There is, you're never left to only one choice. Never. You're never left to only one choice. There's always another way to do it. Now, it may cost you more than you're willing to pay to go that other way, but there's always another way. Huh? Oh, yeah. I remember after the Second World War, and they had the Nuremberg trials. And they were uh, trying these supposed German officers and people who had been responsible for uh, the extermination of many, many people, Jews and others. And there were soldiers who, who stood and testified, I had no choice. I had my orders. I couldn't help myself. There was nothing else I could do. I had my order. I had to turn the ovens on him. I had to shoot him down. I had to do this. No, he didn't. There was another alternative. Now, it's the price would have to be paid. No question about it. High price. If it really meant that much to you, you could say, I refuse to kill these people and be shot yourself. That's what it might cost you. See, I, see but don't tell me there's only one way. There's always something else. There's always a second way out. You might not want to pay that price, but there's another way. Now, what do you do? Do you stay in that relationship and watch that man abuse those children? I know situations where the men are having sexual intercourse with their daughters, forcibly. Now, what's a wife supposed to do? Stay there with that mess? You tell, you're going to tell me that's the will of God? And you've been married to him for seven years and he hasn't even made any kind of change. I mean, it, might, it only takes one blow to, to crack your skull. Just one of his empty whiskey bottles over your head. That's all it takes to put you out of business permanently. All right, here we go. Romans chapter 12. Look at 12 chapter. Oh, I've never, I've never used this verse in relationship to what we're studying, but this is perfect verse. Perfect verse. Romans 12, verse 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. That would mean your husband. But now notice what it says. If it be possible. Now, if you're in an impossible situation, and I have seen some situations that were impossible. I mean, they were impossible. Impossible from the standpoint of the commitment that the people involved in the situation had made. Are you following me? They'd, that, that was, you know, they, they, they had made that, that decision to go that way. I, I remember I was watching, um, I think it was um, either Godfather the Godfather, the movie The Godfather, or Godfather 2. Well, in, anyway, in one of those, a uh, situation had arisen, and uh, one family was blowing away the other family or something, and a situation arose, and one of the, I, I forget who said it, but it was a statement made that was just perfect, a perfect statement. 
about what I just said when I said there are impossible situations. And the guy said, hey, this is the life that we have chosen. You think about that. You know, we're killing each other up. But he said, this is the life we have chosen. And that's where you are. That's what you've chosen. And if you haven't made a choice, somebody else is making one for you. And whenever somebody else makes one for you, you better beware. Because usually they're going to make it for their advantage. And you're going to be left holding the short end of a big stick. Usually. So what I'm saying is, whatever decision you make, I know God wants you to be happy. Now, let me say this for the sake of some that would try to just bow out and say, Well, Pastor Price said if I can't handle it, I'm just going to go ahead and get a divorce. You idiot, I didn't tell you that. <laughs> and don't tell me I shouldn't call people idiots because I didn't call you one, did I? Did I mention your name? Did, that, did idiot offend you? Did idiot apply to you? No problem, right? I mean a thing. So unless your name is idiot, be cool. All right. But I mean, that is, it's idiotic to think that. But here's, there are people who don't want to do what I said a while ago. They don't want to make, pay the price to grow. I don't care how much word you know, you're still going to have to grow. And it's going to take some time to grow. You, you can speak in tongues, speak with tongues, quote all the scripture you want. Honey, you're going to have to grow. And you're going to have, if, you, if you're really committed to the word and committed to one another, you're going to stay there and there's going to be some rough edges. It's going to take a little while to sand them down and smooth them off till everything just sort of fits like a number nine foot in a number nine shoe. Are you following me? But now, there are some people who don't want to do it. Now, I was counseling with a couple one time. And, and this that I'm going to tell you, the, the issue at hand is what's really the problem with most Christians in their relationship. I was counseling with this couple and... They had married right here in the church, and then they were having a problem. And so they came to me. And I sat, and as I usually do, I said, well, uh, how may I help you? How may I assist you? And then I let them talk and tell me the situation. And I tell you what, it was so dumb. <laughs> I had to do everything I could to maintain my composure, <laughs> to keep from telling them, you idiots. You know, because what they were doing was really dumb. But this is where a whole lot of people are, Christians. Now, I'm not even talking about the world, but Christians. The biggest problem was, and the singularly most common problem in relationships, why Christians, I mean, when I say Christians now, I mean Christians that are knowledgeable about the Word. See, there are a lot of Christians out there, they don't know even where Genesis is in the Bible. Because they go to churches that don't teach them anything. So, they, you know, they're Christian. They've made a commitment to Christ, but they have no knowledge about the Word. I'm talking about folks sitting in churches like this one or others where they are taught, not preached to and entertained, but actually taught something out of the Bible, the Word of God. And the biggest problem is, and the problem with this couple was, the reason they were having the friction is because of selfishness. They wanted their way. And they didn't want to give. You cannot have a marriage, not based on God's word, and one that will be fruitful and productive and joyful to be in without giving and taking. In the political realm, they call it compromise. That's what politics is, is compromise. But see, that, that word compromise is usually used in a negative connotation. But it's not nece necessarily a negative word. Compromise simply means giving and taking. And you have to do that to live with any other human on this planet. You have to give something, you've got to take something. Now, I'm not talking about taking, getting your head whipped. I don't mean that kind of taking. But what I mean, you, like with my wife, I have to put up with her. I've said this before, but it's, it's a good illustration. Uh, I, am, I am a perfectionist. I am not perfect. Now, most perfectionists, if they don't know how to handle it, they make everybody in the world around them totally miserable because you can't do anything to please them. Nothing ever. I'm not that way. I just like things in order. I like things neat. I like things right on time. And I'll say it. Most people won't, but I'll say it. But I have had to learn my wife is not that exact. Like keeping things neat, like on the countertop or the, the face bowl or the mirror right behind her, her face bowl. And it's always splattered with water. <laughs> and she's, my wife is a flinger. Do you know what a flinger is? <laughs> you know, it's all, and water goes in all directions. I mean, that's what, she gets to wash her hand and watch you go into the towel. <laughs> and water's everywhere. Well, I'm just the opposite. My mirror looks like it hadn't hardly been used. 
anything get on, I always wipe it off when I'm finished. I mean, I have a routine that I go through, see? Well, that's me. Well, see, she has to put up with me. I have to put up with her. That's what I'm talking about, compromise. See, I could go off the wall and say, I ain't going to live with this woman no more. She messes up the mirrors. <laughs> well, I mean, that's not good enough to break up a good relationship over, although some have done it for less than that. See what I mean? That's what I'm talking about, giving and taking. So she lets me be a perfectionist in my part, and I let her be the way she is in her part. <laughs> But that's what I mean by giving and taking. And, and you're going to do that all year. We've been married 32 years and we're still giving and taking. Are you following me? But that's what makes it work. And if you're not willing to stay there long enough, I don't care who you marry, it's just going to be another set of problems. You think he's big, tall, and handsome. You think she's pretty and petite and all that kind of stuff. I, you're just going to get another set of problems. Everybody has them. And when I say problem, I don't mean it in that sense, but I mean everybody has their thing, their ways, and you're going to have to put up with it. I don't care. You think you got, you may have the best thing going. You better be cool. You think it could be better over there on the other side. You may get Frankenstein. <laughs> you got Lassie now, and that's not too bad. <laughs> you fool around, you may get a hold of good old Frankenstein. <laughs> you know, keep working with it. You may have a diamond in the rough. A diamond never looks very much like anything at first. It's a piece of smoky looking rock. So what I'm saying is, you that are unwilling to get off of your selfishness, see? Some of you are selfish and you want your way and that's where your real problem is in your relationship. It's not a problem of immorality. Immorality, it's not a problem of, of the fact she can't cook or she burns your toe, it's not even that. It's the fact you're selfish and you want your way and you're not willing to give in. And then if you get one on the other side that's just like that, you're gonna have this going on all the time. Somebody has to give in somewhere along the line. And if you're really right in the word, you're going to be the one to give in. When I say you, whichever one of you, that fits you. See, both husband and wife is what it means. See? Otherwise, you're just going to have a problem. If you think you're going to get married and everything's just going to be peaches and cream from that day forward, you, you, you're living in a, a dream world, an unreal existence. Are you following me? So you have to decide whether you stay there in that relationship or not. It's not for me to make that decision. But I've given you my best shot on it. And like I say, you don't have to agree with anything I've said. Just be miserable. and Stay right on there. You think you've got to stay there the rest of your life? Fine. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you to stay. I'm not going to tell you to get a divorce. One thing I, am, I do want to leave with you and that I am going to tell you is that whatever you do, God does not want you on a guilt trip the rest of your life as a result of it. Whatever you decide to do, if you're going to sit and be guilty and feel unclean and unworthy the rest of your life, then you've played into the hands of the devil. And you're not doing anything that's going to bless yourself or God or the kingdom of God. Okay? So that's my best shot on marriage, divorce, and the obligation. You do whatever you want with it. And, and like I said, there's no need to write me a letter to tell me you disagree. It's just disagree. That's all. But don't waste my time. I haven't got time to read, something, read a letter for you to tell me you disagree. It's all, and I have no problem with you disagreeing. Just disagree and you go ahead and do your... I'm not going to know what you're doing anyway. Right? I can't see beyond it. See, you can see me, but I can't see you. I can't see you. I know you're mad. I, uh, but, but you just be cool and everything will be all right. Now, we're going to move on in our study on the Christian family. And now we want to talk about the duties of the husbands. I said this in the other service. And when I said the duties of the husbands, the ladies just lit up like neon signs. But don't worry, ladies. I'm going to come to you. Soon enough. All right. Duties of the husbands. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Ephesians chapter 5. The duties of the husband. Now understand again, we're, we're looking at these things from the standpoint of what the Bible says, not what society says. There's a whole lot of things going on in society that are not sanctioned by God. Okay. And there are a lot of things that people do just because they've been doing them so long and they feel like that that's right or normal. But as the song so aptly puts it, it ain't necessarily so. But we want to see what does God say and base all of our actions and all of our determination from the Word of God. If we do that, we're always on safe ground. And we'll always have God involved in our circumstances. When we depart from the Word, then we've departed from God. 
And I'm telling you, you need God in your relationship. Hmm? Oh, yes. You need the architect while you're trying to build your house. You need to constantly refer to the architect and refer to the plans to be sure you're building properly. A lot of folks go to building houses without the architect. That's why there are so many leaning towers of pieces. <laughs> Their lives are leaning over like that. Because they never, they never consult with the architect, the grand architect of all the ages. They don't, watch, they don't look at the plans to see if they're building everything correctly. They're just going on how they, well, I feel it. it, it I'm just going to do what comes naturally. You're going to naturally mess up. <laughs> That's what you're going to naturally do. All right, Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 25. First, husbands, do I have any husbands here? Yes. All right, say husbands. husbands. All right. Husbands, love your wives even as, underline the words even as. Very important words. Even as. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Now, can't you see that a person who has no knowledge of the word of God is not going to be able to love his wife like Christ loved the church? Because if he doesn't have accurate knowledge of the word of God, he's not going to know how Christ treats the church. So then what he does is he draws his game plan from the television soap operas or the movies or the world and tries that mess out on his wife. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. But the rule here, husbands love your wife even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. What we have to do is to find out how does Jesus love the church? I, as a husband, must relate to my wife like Jesus relates to the church. And I'm telling you that if you do that, we would, be, we, we would have to do a whole lot of changing of a lot of people that are here today and probably watching my television that call themselves Christians and speak with other tongues and carry Bibles and tape recorders. That are not loving their wives like Christ loved the church. Christ never, but never abuses the church. But I see so many men abusing their wives, not just physically, but socially, psychologically, abusing them. There was some uh, to do not too long ago in the Christian community about this business of submission. There was a whole lot on what was called submission. And a lot of people were, you know, Christians always have to come up with some new mess, just like the world does got to have a new hobby. They can't just stay on the straight and narrow way. There's got to be some new thing. But anyway, this, this thing of submission was real big. And there were guys and women going around telling everybody, you're supposed to submit to your husband no matter what he does, no matter who he is, no matter how he acts. Oh, that's so dumb. That's so dumb. That's, you think God wants you to submit to the devil? I mean, I can't even, I can't even believe the, the, the so-called intelligence of some people that call themselves Christians to think that God your father would want you to knuckle down and submit to some beast a dog would treat you better than that man has been treating you and God wants you to to knuckle down to him I can't believe that submission and there are a lot of men that go around with this with this thing oh me Tarzan you Jane kind of attitude you know I'm the boss I, I, I'm the head of the house I, I, I'm the I, I, I'm the head of the house I, 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 I'm the man you don't have to you don't have to do that I don't think I've ever told my wife I don't I don't recall I've ever said to my wife I'm the head of the house you know you know that type of statement I don't recall ever saying that I I have attempted to live in such a way that I demand the respect I don't have I don't tell my children, I don't tell them I'm the head of the house, you know, as such. But I live in such a way they know who's the head of the house. I carry myself in that way. My wife should only submit to me to the extent that I treat her the way Jesus treats the church. If not, a woman doesn't have to submit to her husband because you got some husband telling you to do all kind of crazy things. I, I knew a situation, I counseled with these people. They used to belong to this church, but 
they don't anymore. And this fellow, I guess he, he might have been five to ten years older than the girl. And he had been out in the world before he came to Christ. Now, supposedly he accepted Christ, was saved, filled with the Spirit. He had the Bible with all the right colors and stuff in Mark, had everything marked right. And uh, so, I, you know, I assume he was a Christian. And, uh, but, but he had been out in the world, and he had done everything big enough to do. He had done it. You name it, that, that was him. He had done that. And what he had done is he, he had allowed himself to become a sexaholic. You've heard of alcoholics? Well, you can be a sexaholic. And it can be just as addictive as alcohol or drugs or anything else. And while, here we go now, I told you, be sure, if your kids are watching, you better have them cut out because I'm getting ready to go on it now. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know exactly what or when, but, you know, but it, it needs to be said because I have to deal with this all the time uh, in counseling sessions and we, in letters and stuff. Oh, some of the letters you should, oh, I tell you, it's some letters with some stuff in it. I mean, you, you, you couldn't have a worse situation if you took uh, the edge of night General Hospital, <laughs> Dynasty, uh, Hotel, what's the other ones? Yeah, tell me about the other one, Dallas. <laughs> tell me about JR. <laughs> this, you, you, could, you could put all that together and that would look like kindergarten to some of this stuff. Well, he had, he had allowed himself to become a, a sexaholic. He, he became addicted. He was addicted. So you can become addicted to things. And you can become addicted to sex. And he'd gotten addicted to oral sex. And uh, he felt like he couldn't live without it. And, and see, oral sex, and I'll get into this more in this series when we get into the area of sex, but this is just a a part of it because it has to do with husbands love your wives. But see, oral sex is not organically normal. There is no biological need for it. You know, you could eat garbage in a gar out of the garbage disposal too. You know, just, if you got a garbage disposal, you could eat garbage out of it. But that doesn't mean that, you know, doesn't make it right, does it? Well, oral sex is a, is a perversion of the mind. It's all in your mind. It is not a, you don't come from the factory with a biological need for oral sex. Now I know I'm med meddling with some of your baby carriages here. <laughs> but we need to meddle with and shake that baby out. Amen. But anyway, this guy had become, he, he was addicted to it. Now we're talking about husbands love your wife. Now, here's a man supposed to be a Christian filled with the spirit in the word. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Well, he, he was so addicted to this thing that he, he, he did everything he could to get his wife to suck his penis. I mean, that, that's what oral sex is on the man's side, okay? I want to be sure you understand what I'm talking about. That's what it is. And uh, he, would, uh, he would use all kinds of, you know, ways on her. And one of the things he would do, if she, and she didn't want to do it. She felt like it was unclean, if she felt like it was dirty, she just didn't feel like it was Christian. She didn't feel like it was right. But she loved this guy. I guess, I guess that's love. You know, whatever, that's what she said. She loved the ground this guy walked on. She almost idolized this guy. And what he would do, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. If she wouldn't, he would stop talking to her. He just wouldn't talk to her. He'd go a whole week and wouldn't say anything to her. You know, act like she wasn't there, in other words. Just treat her like she didn't exist. This is her punishment. You don't play my game, I won't talk to you. You know, that's not the way Christ treats the church. Boy, if he did us that way, if he went a week and didn't talk to us, you talk about being in a boat with no oars up the creek. Man, we'd be going over the falls. That's not how Jesus treats the church. And then she'd go ahead and do it, and then she'd feel like a dog for three weeks. You know, she'd feel so bad about it and unclean. She walking around with her head down, and she couldn't lift it. She, she, she was ashamed in it within herself. But to please him, ought to be pleasing the Lord. 
pleasing no man with his warped, sadistic, perverted idea of sex that came directly from the devil. I, I guess you're going to tell me the Holy Ghost inspired that. Hmm? Think, you think maybe the Holy Ghost inspired that? Maybe one of the angels. One, you think one of the angels invented oral sex? No. It comes from the devil. That's a perversion. I don't care how much pleasure you get out of it. I don't care how it, good it feels to you. It's still a perversion. It's unnatural. Well, he would treat her that way. And it was a mess. Now they're divorced. She's living with some guy and I didn't marry to him. One of the children that they had died. Uh... Awful, horrible death. But you see, you can't play around with the word of God. See, to whom much is given of him shall much be required. See, they knew too much. They were, they were exposed to too much. And you pay a heavy price when you go against knowledge. See, But that's not the way Jesus treats the church. Jesus doesn't whip up on the church. Some of you men probably watching me right now. I, we hear about, I hear about it here. Guys beating up on their wives. Now, don't misunderstand me. I realize some of these big mouth women, you want to smack them in the mouth. They make you want to put one on them. I understand. I, I mean, I understand. But I mean, you're, you're a child of God. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You have the Word of God. You're an intelligent person. There's another way to deal with that. If the only way you can get your point across is by violence, then you don't need the Spirit of God. Jesus, suppose Jesus whipped up on you. Huh? Suppose Jesus whipped up on you. And I don't care what happened in your childhood that has got nothing to do with who you are now in Christ Jesus. Your past is dead. So I don't want to hear that garbage about you are a better child. I don't care what your daddy did to you. I don't care what your mama did, your grandmama, your, the dog or the cat did to you back there. That has nothing to do with your actions now. You are in Christ. You have the word of God. You're filled with the spirit and you know better. So don't, don't give me that mess. That I was a better child. I don't care what you were. That's all the more reason you don't want to be one now to your kids. Dummy. I have no respect for any man that would strike the body of Christ. And when you hit your wife, your Christian wife, you are, you are hitting Jesus. Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Every time you slap your wife upside the head, black her eye, and I've seen some like that come in, come in trying to hide a bunch of, bunch of makeup on, and you knew something was wrong. The husband had hit her, blacked her eye. I, 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 don't, I, have, I don't even have that much respect for a man that would hit a woman. I mean, you ought to be able to deal with it better than that. Especially if you claim to know the word. Now, understand, somebody in the world, you expect that. Beat up on each other, you expect that in the world. That's what keeps the police department with a job. Huh? But Christian, in the word, filled with the spirit, and beating up on, hitting each other, the man especially, abusing the woman... I think I, I think I may have told Mike this when Michael is my son-in-law, one of my son-in-laws. I think I said this to you when I talked with you. But uh, if I didn't, I'm going to say it to you now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, I know they say, well, you're not supposed to get involved in domestic affairs. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. But I believe I told him when, I, when, we, when we asked to marry my daughter and I told him, we sat down and we talked and I told him one of the things, I did not go through hell and high water to raise my kids for some BB brain man to whip up on her. And I said, if, you, if, you, if I didn't tell you, I'm telling you now. <laughs> if you hit her, see I don't care though, even though she carries his last name, that doesn't change the fact that she's my daughter. And if he hits her, and I find out about it, you got to deal with me. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not big and bad. I'm not that kind of person. But I do know how to light fuses. <laughs> hmm? Hmm? 
See, like, see, like Charles Crawford here, if you get bad with him, he, he, use some, go, he may have to lay back to some of his judo days, some of his karate days. He may, he may break your head with his hand. Well, I'm not bad. I'm not big and bad. I'll tell you that right now. I'm not big and bad, but I know how to light fuses. Huh? I know how to make a Molotov cocktail. Huh? So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways to do it. You don't just have to be big and bad. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but I'm not, I, didn't, I didn't go through the hell I went through. I mean, you talk about hell and high water. It was to raise a child and raise a child right, to bring her up for some man, to abuse her physically. You have to deal with me. I don't care what anybody says about any domestic. Now, I didn't raise her up for your punching bag. You beat on her, you're going to beat on me. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Jesus does not abuse us physically. You have no business laying your hand on your wife. You're a dog if you do and you need to be spaded. And if you don't know what that means, go look it up in your encyclopedia. But we need to realize as Christians, I mean, there's some of the things that we get across our desk, some of the people we have to talk to, the letters we get, the telephone call. I mean, it's unreasonable. Absolutely. I, you, I mean, I'd expect that if some rank sinner called me up on the phone, but these are folks supposed to be in the Word. Right here, whipping up on your wife. You wouldn't, I bet you wouldn't whip up on Jesus. But that makes you a big muscle man, doesn't it? You whip up on your wife. Beat up on your wife. That's not the way Jesus treats the church. See, he said, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. See, love, you say you love her. Yeah, I love her. I really love her. No, you don't. If you love, you would be giving. You would give. You would give love. For God so loved the world that he gave. Love is always expressed in giving, in doing something. See, the word love doesn't mean anything. That is only the title of an act. Love is an action. Love is doing something. Not, love is not saying something. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> Anybody can say that. They pay for People make million dollars a picture to say, I love you. <laughs> ain't no big thing. Love is an action. Love is the giving of yourself. An expression. God loved us and gave us his very best. We need to give the very best we have to our wives. And maybe if you start treating her right, she'd start treating you right. There's a, something peculiar about the human psyche. I mean, he responds to kind. You know, there's a law of self-preservation that's built into our flesh. You keep on whipping up on me, I'm going to start defending myself. <laughs> you know, every time I walk in the door, you slap me down on the floor. going to be one day you're going to slap and you're you going to come up with a nub. You're not going to have a hand. You only take that for so long. Are you following me? So we, we, need to, we need to understand love is a giving. We, we ought to be giving to our wives. And maybe if you loved her and expressed it for her, maybe she wouldn't be running off of the mouth so much. Maybe she had no other way to get your dumb attention but to, to hassle you and hound you and, and, and complain and gripe. You won't do what's right. What, else, what, what does she have left to do? See? Maybe her nagging is because you, not, you haven't done what you ought to do. I'm just saying, maybe. I would look at all these areas, first of all, to find out, am I doing my job? I want to know that I'm doing my job. I'm not going to let anybody do a better job than I am as a husband. I'm the best. Am I the best? <laughs> Woman, you better say, am I the best? <laughs> But the point is, I work on being a good husband. Husband, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Would, the, would, the, would, would Christ tell us the truth or lie to us? Then you ought to tell your wife the truth. When she's fat and out of shape, you ought to tell her. Instead of taking time looking at other women that are just what you'd really like your wife to be. And then you don't have the decency and the honesty to tell her. And then be an example of it yourself, Shamu. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of like, it's kind of like
like out in the world. You know, the guy, the guy runs amok through all the pennies he can find and lays with everything that's got legs and then he wants to marry the virgin. <laughs> Dirty dog. What about the one you want to marry? Doesn't she deserve a virgin? Never even think about that. I want a virgin. Ain't hardly none left. You've been screwing them all. Huh? What about her? Doesn't she deserve a virgin? Huh? Doesn't she deserve it? You want a virgin? What about her? Like one story we know about, the guy ran around on his wife, had a girlfriend in, in, you know, like in every city as it were, and just worked himself until he had nothing left. Now he decides to settle down and come home to his wife, and she's now in the word, lively, ready to go, and he can't even get it up. And he's telling her, I would if I could, but I can't. No, I didn't say that to be funny. No, I didn't say that to be funny. I'm not laughing. It's not funny. It's sad. But that's not the way. Christ doesn't mistreat us. You ought to tell her the truth. You didn't marry her. She wasn't a side 19 when you married her. Well, it's partly your fault that she's that big. I mean, that is if you don't particularly like full-figured women. <laughs> Full of fat. And don't tell me I don't like fat people. I love them. If I didn't love them, I would never say anything about them. I just let you eat yourself right onto the cemetery because I do love you that I say anything. It's not, you think it's easy to say it and have you throwing darts at me and writing me old dumb letters and being criticized? You think that's fun? I could easily avoid all of that, say nothing. And that's the way a whole lot of men have done with their wives and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and fat and sloppy and out of shape and then you walk down at the office looking at all them little fillies going by and you, you opened up for some problems, temptations you don't even need. When you married her, she was campus queen. That was then. You ought to tell her the truth. I tell my wife the truth. And, and you could, I mean, and you, I tell you what will happen. Your, your wife will know you love her. Some of you don't like the way your wife dresses. You're always commenting on what so-and-so has on. Ooh, so-and-so got on the one. So-and-so, why don't you go buy one of those for your wife? Hmm? I would, but I don't like to shop. I don't either. I don't like to shop, especially you spend the whole day and don't find what you want. Look like my feet hurt worse then. Wasn't so bad if at least we found what we wanted. I could deal with that, but shop all day long and then come back with nothing and my feet be hurt. Oh my goodness, my feet are hurting me. But I love my wife. I want my wife to look the best. This is my queen. This is my princess. This is the one that shares the throne with me. I want her to be the best. And I know what looks best on her better than anybody else. I'm not going to send her down there to them stores for them vultures to talk. Ah, darling, it's just made for you. <laughs> Why, darling, it's just wonderful. Why, if you're there, you look like a picture postcard. <laughs> Marvelous. Look at how it fits you. Seven sizes too big. <laughs> they want to make a sale. They'll tell you anything. Anything to make a sale. Very few. You do find some. Thank God that you find a few that really will tell you the truth. But nobody should be able to tell your wife the truth better than you. Huh? Tell her the truth. Take time. Go with her. Sure, it's costly. Everything is costly. It's costly if you don't go with her. It's going to cost you more because she done spent your money and come back with a frock you don't like. Now, if you go with her, then at least if she spent the money, she may get something you like. And that is at least some consolation. 99% of the time, I take the time to go with my wife. Sure, it takes time. I take my off day or whatever and go with her. But I know what she looks best in. 
That's my woman. I want her to look good. I like to see women looking good. Now, everybody has you know, different strokes for different folks. I like to see pretty ladies look pretty. That's just me. I don't want them. I don't have no lustful desires after them. But I just like to see, a, when I see a pretty woman, I like to see her dressed prettily, if there is such a word. Well, I want my, I'm not going to let some other woman upstage my wife. Amen. Understand within reason. Don't act a fool and go out and get yourself in debt. But what I mean, I'm in a position I can do it. Couldn't always do it, but I can do it now. And I've been doing it. And if I see, if I see something on some other woman, I say, oh, that's looking good, honey. I say it to myself. I don't tell her that. <laughs> really get in trouble then. I find, see where I can find anyone to go by my wife. I say, that looks good on her. It looked good on my wife. That looked good on her. Well, you ought to tell your wife. And if you're not on speaking terms with your wife, then something's really wrong. And if you can't talk about things like that, you've got a real problem. But that's, I believe that's what Jesus would do. In fact, that's what he does. He tells us all the truth in his word. He tells us what will hurt us, what will harm us. Tells us how to avoid it. Tells us just exactly what to do so that we can have a prosperous and abundant life. He tells us the truth. He doesn't lie to us and tell us we look good when we don't look good. Husband, start being honest with your wife. But it'll take you being honest with yourself, first of all, in order to do it. And then be an example of whatever it is you want your wife to be. You can't ask her to look good and be petite and you fat and out of shape. Huh? Come on. Because after all, when she married you, she did not marry the great white whale. Huh? You were looking good. First string on the football team. Stomach like a washboard, hard as rock. Now, we won't, we won't even get into that. Huh? What are you doing, Charlie? I'm going to see. I'm going to see just how hard. I'm going to see just how hard it really is. Let's see. <laughs> well, it takes work. And you have to stay on it. It's a lifelong job. All right, now watch. The key is this. Keep in mind. Husbands, love your wife even as. That's the key. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. If you use that as a rule of thumb, to treat your wife in whatever way, Treat her like Christ treats the church, man, you won't have a problem. And I'm here to tell you, fellas, women respond to being treated nicely. I mean, that's normal women. Now, you do have some, you got some women, you know, that, but and if you married to one of those, well, I mean, I'll, I'd have to leave you with the Lord, brother. There's nothing I can do for you. Because you have some women that are ducks. I mean, they're just flat out ducks. If you don't know what a duck is, go to your local pond. You'll find out. <laughs> You know, and so if you're married to one of those, you're just going to have to pray mightily. But if you're normal, your wife is normal, they respond to kindness. Not beating up on them, whipping up on them, slapping them around, blacking their eyes, treating them worse than you would treat the maid. They don't respond too kindly to that. Okay? All right, watch. Verse 5 again, 25. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now go to verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Notice what he said. You ought to do this. So ought men to love their wife as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now here's where a big problem lies. And it's a problem with a lot of people, even with the, with the wives. And we'll get into that when we get over into the wives situation. But one reason that some men have a problem loving their wives, they don't love themselves. See, you don't love yourself. You have to love you. Brother Price, do you mean to tell me we're supposed to love ourselves? Why, that's idolatry. No, it's not. That's obedience. Not idolatry. The Bible said, love thy neighbor as thyself. Love thy neighbor as thyself. In other words, love him like you love you. That's why a lot of you have a problem loving other people and relating to your neighbor, your neighbor being anybody else in the world because you don't love yourself. And if you don't love you, you can't love me. It's going to be very difficult for you to love somebody else if you don't think highly of yourself and love yourself. See, I love me. God does. I must be lovable. The Lord loved me. He loved me enough to save me. He loved me enough to adopt me into his family. Honey, when you start adopting folk into your family, especially when you ain't getting nothing from the state, you know, you're just adopting them because you want to, 
Man, if, if God loves me, I ought to love myself. Love thy neighbor as thyself. You cannot love somebody else if you don't love yourself. A lot of people don't like them, then, let alone love. They don't even like themselves. But you're going to start learning how to like yourself. God likes you. Jesus likes you. Holy Ghost likes you. The only person that doesn't like you is the devil, and you don't care about him. <laughs> you don't want him to like you anyway. Huh? But you need to learn how to love yourself. Listen to it. Listen to what it says. Let's read it again. He says, so ought men to love their wives. You ought to do this as their own bodies. Next time, because I just ran out of time. Stay right where you are. If this message has been a blessing to you, the announcer will tell you some very important information about how you may obtain an audio cassette of the message which you have just heard for your own spiritual enrichment and edification. Remember that these telecasts and radio broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers and listeners. And remember also these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. This program is now available to you on CD or DVD to share with your family and friends. CD copies are available for your love gift of any amount. DVD copies are available for your love gift of $15 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Apostle Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Indicate the number you see on your screen. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and join us again on the ever-increasing Faith Network, bringing to you...